was sitting on the steps outside the airport at Adelaide. No map, no nothing, no telephone. Thought, okay, what do I do? Because the airport was closing. <laughs> what do I do? This cab driver, you know, here's this pretty obvious non-Kazakhstani. <laughs> pretty obvious, I think. <laughs> yeah, he thought so too. And he came up to me. He said, you know, you know, his, obviously his English was no better than my uh, Kazaki. <laughs> And it, you know, he's, but he conveyed to me, "How do I help you? I had no, I had no money, you know, because of these these people were supposed to have taken care of all that. But this guy was kind enough to come take care of me, literally, get me to the hotel, get me checked in, and it was just the neatest experience. You know, and he's, I got to tell you, I don't know of any other industry where you're going to have the opportunity to do those kind of things. I'll tell you another anecdote while I'm there. I had the privilege. This has been." I don't know, seven or eight years ago, got to teach some short, short courses in Beijing. And I had never intensively been involved on a nose-to-nose -nose basis with somebody that really fundamentally thought differently than I do. And I don't mean that in a negative way, because my, my job was basically a class similar to this to teach them how to do production analysis. I, all of the code that you're going to look at here probably tonight or tomorrow I wrote, well, most all of it. There's a little bit that's in a couple of other people wrote, but most of it's stuff I wrote. And they were trying to run the program, and it would blow up. Well, I knew it worked because I was working problems. I was doing, I'd given them the data sets to use. So I knew the program worked, but they couldn't get it to work. And I'm going, whatever, because I had installed it on their computers. I had tested it. I knew for sure that the data sets worked. And they couldn't make it go. I was just blown away. Then I noticed, because I finally decided I'd go to the back of the room and watch them, watch what they were doing. They would start at the right-hand side of the screen and work from right to left. I started at the left-hand side of the screen and worked from left to right. That simple change in perspective destroyed the ability of the program to function. That simple, I, would, I had never in my wildest expectations thought through that the thought process of Mr. A would be different from Mr. C. It never clicked until I saw that. And you know, it was such an exciting thing to me, and I mean this in the most positive way. I would never have had the privilege, had it not been to be in this industry, to see that, yeah, Crafton, you thought your process just fine, but your process is not the only one that works. Because once I realized what they were doing, it literally took me about an hour to change the program. And the next day, voila, they could work it just as well as I could. I just had not thought like they did. And that was just so neat of an experience to see that transition. Anyway, that's a long side trip. I just blew away 15 minutes of otherwise usable time. Production data, because it is the means by which money changes hands, has embedded in it a fiduciary obligation. And the minute you raise up the question of a fiduciary obligation, you are dealing with one very simple fact. And I hate to say this, and with all due respect again to the well testers, I have no legal obligation other than ethics, I have no I have no legal obligation to report to you shut-in data correctly. All right? And you say, well, they're going to do it. Maybe, maybe not. I don't have a legal obligation to report it to you correctly. On the other hand, I do have a very specific, it's called fraud. And fraud is a felony. There is no level of fraud in any country, believe it or not, that is not a felony. In some countries, the commission of fraud is actually a death sentence. It's that bad. In, in some societies, it is considered that bad to commit fraud. To misrepresent production data is prima facie first phase, no proof required. It is proof that you have committed fraud to have misrepresented the production data. Think about that. I mean, that's, we're not talking about just something all kind of ho-hum. We're talking about in some societies, 
having deliberately misrepresented that cash flow train, transaction is something you could get killed for. And Kraken's going to stand up and say to you, and I, may, I mean this with absolute sincerity, this analysis approach intends to look at data sets that carry that kind of importance. Now, that then leads to the discussion about what is the net present value of that cash flow stream? What things impact it? Well, that raises a really interesting scenario because what's the density of natural gas? At atmospheric conditions, what's the density of natural gas? Yeah, well, a gas gravity, a gas gravity of 0.65. How many pounds per cubic foot at standard conditions is natural gas? Well, now let's back up. What is the what is the density of water, of pure water, at standard conditions? Right on. Oil, roughly 40-ish. Okay, roughly, give or take, depends on the API gravity, all that stuff, but something in the order of 40 pounds per cubic foot. Gas is in the order of 0.02 pounds per cubic foot. Well, all of a sudden, I am confronted with the fact Money's going to change hands based on the gas, and it's going to change hands based on the oil, and it may change hands based on the water. But when I'm looking at this issue, you know, from a petroleum engineering point of view, it's all about the volumes. And the cash flow is all about the volumes. But when I start looking at the physics, it's about the weights. <coughs> and all of a sudden, I'm confronted with the fact that the most important variable in my response is that which weighs the most, the water. Oh, that just made a mess of things, didn't it? Well, the reason I want this before you, many prospects depend on the price of water far more than they do the price of oil or gas. And the price of water may be its disposal or its sale price, depending on it. There's a play in western Oklahoma in which, again, the oil and gas are not the valuable commodities. It's the iodine in the produced water. Think about that. You know, so there's, there's a lot more to the equation than just the fair, you know, Oil's worth $85 a barrel today, and gas is worth three forty. dollars Now, that's not the variable. There's other pieces. Anyway, net present value is driven by your perception of the value of money. Is it worth 35% per year? Is it worth 10% per year? But when you start wrestling with this, we've got this, co this contradiction. Because I'm going to look at, on this graph, I'm going to look at how time passes. Right? I want to understand how time passes, but I want to look at how the system consumes energy because this is an energy relationship. All right? Now, you say, well, nobody's ever talked to me about this being an energy relationship. No, I understand that, and that's just fine. But when I think about this, and several of you have had thermal, and not of you have had thermal or will have it soon enough, the numerator of that is in the sense of thermodynamics this is one of the reasons you want to go take thermal, believe it or not. Heaven forbid. But that numerator is what's referred to as the Gibbs free energy. We in the petroleum business think about it in terms of pressure. Ah. Well, you don't get Gibbs free energy in your thermal class probably until about the eighth week or so, easily two thirds of the way through the class. But you will discuss Gibbs free energy. And here's one of the reasons why it matters believe it or not. But we talk about Gibbs free energy. I know several of your eyes are going, <laughs> it's okay. I just want you to understand. And to me, one of the things, you know, when I, was, when I was at your place in my education process, nobody had ever connected the dots. I mean, nobody had ever connected the dots for me. I was going like, okay, I'm taking thermal and I'm gonna go out on the drilling rig. Uh, it didn't click. I mean, it just was, here's this point, this point, that point. What, one of the things that I have found that is really important to me is trying to find ways to connect the dots. You know, here's one of them. That thermodynamic concept applies. The numerator of that silly thing is Gibbs free energy. The denominator is momentum. It's the momentum of the system. So when I look at this, oh, we need to go further. But anyway, the slope of the line is how the system consumes energy as the pressure wave moves further away from the well bore. So it's really a momentum relationship. It's saying, okay, the mass rate coming to the well bore consumes some energy that's in the numerator. 
right? We look at it as a pressure drop. You could also look at it as a temperature drop. You could look at it as an enthalpy drop. There's all kinds of different ways that would get you to the same place, okay? So one of the reasons why it's worthwhile to study the thermo, in spite of how frustrating the class is, because it is, <laughs> but when you stop and think about the processes we're looking at, all of a sudden maybe it begins to make some sense that those dots do connect, all right? So the slope of the line is how the system increasingly consumes energy as it ages. All right? That's the reason this line gets steeper. That's the reason it gets higher up as time passes. All right. The next graph. Oh, it's the same graph. Once in a system, we have not only the way it consumes time as it ages, this, the consumption of energy increases as time passes, we also have this idea that there's a certain amount of overhead. That overhead, in our terminology, is the skin, the completion, effi uh, completion efficiency, uh, an effective or an apparent fracture length, what have you, all right? Well, it exhibits, it exhibits itself by an incrementally, but re usually relatively constant, elevation on the graph, all right? So that height is simply a measure of the connectivity between the wellbore and the reservoir. And again, it can change in time. All right? Is that okay? That makes some sense? So one is the time, how the energy consumption changes as the system ages. That's that first graph, and that's a measure of transmissibility of the system. This is bringing to light the idea that there is a certain amount of overhead. It's simply a fixed cost, the amount of energy it takes to get the gas out the door, or the oil out the door, or the water out the door. And we refer to this as an apparent fracture length or skin. All right? And again, this is log of time, or the square root of time in the extreme anisotropy case. The units of this guy we're going to dig into in a minute. The next piece, on the square root of time plot, Basically, that equation, instead of having an E1 function, becomes the square root. All right? So you make the geometry changes, and you see a different, a different signature. All right? So when I am in the extreme anisotropy case, where square root of time applies, the slope of the line is a measure of the degree of connectivity between the, the well bore and the reservoir. Its character changes, right? In the other setting, log of time versus RPI, that slope was a measure of energy consumption in the system associated with the movement of the pressure wave. Now, because of the change in geometry, it becomes a direct measure of that connectivity. So it kind of changes character, okay? When I'm in pseudo steady state, Boundary dominated. The pressure wave has moved out and has hit the boundary. The picture changes because now I'm going to use that Hornley equivalent time, Q over Q, the idea that you had wrestled with when you started plotting Horner plots. Now, the slope of the line, when I use this mass balance time, the slope of the line is a measure of the pore volume. That raises a very delicate issue. Suppose I had two wells producing, and they start out producing very equal reservoir quality, everything is equal, and the flow rates are equal. The pressure waves are going to move same speed, because they were put on production the same day. Boom, they're going to bump into each other, and they're going to go into interference, right? Now, a good analogy, imagine, uh, by way of a, a mental picture, and, and this is kind of funky, but imagine you had a box and you filled it with sand. All right? You've got a box, you filled it with sand, and you poked a hole, or two holes for this case, in the bottom. Okay? You got your finger over the hole so the sand can't come out. And now you remove your finger and the sand starts going out those two holes in the bottom of the box. Okay? What's going to happen to the surface of the sand up here on top? You're going to see dimples in it, aren't you? And those dimples are going to gradually grow. And pretty soon, the dimples are going to bump into each other. 
Well, in our terminology, the event of the dimples bumping into each other is the onset of interference. And as the dimples continue to grow, they're going to bump into the sides of the box as well. Right? Does that make sense? Now, there's a variable in this equation. Suppose I drill this hole much bigger than this one. I mean, a whole lot bigger. You know, this one's like a quarter of an inch in diameter, and this one's two inches in diameter. So the volume of sand that can come out of this side is much bigger. That dimple is going to grow much faster, isn't it? So it's going to wind up taking over this guy. Yeah? Well, that becomes this picture right here, because what we're looking at is the pore volume that creates this slope. And it's a measure of both the overhead, the size of the hole, and the transmissibility of the system, the volume available. So the slope of this line is directly measurable as a function of this pore volume or drained area idea. All right? What happened? The fundamental mistake, and I shouldn't say it's a mistake, the fundamental change of perspective in thinking about using classic well test theory for production data is really a very simple thing. I don't know whether you've gone through the derivation, and unless you're in the graduate class, you probably don't want to, but if you go through the blood, guts, and chicken feathers derivation, you are confronted with the fact that as you go through the derivation, you reach a point at which you have to say what the conditions are at the well bore. The well bore is Constant rate. That's the one we usually say. The other is the well bore is at constant pressure. That's not so common, but that's one of the other boundary conditions. If you do the derivation in the traditional way, that's what happens. I got the wild hair one night because I was so bored doing the derivation that I started by putting in all those dimensionless variables to start with. So I introduced dimensionless pressure, dimensionless time, all that stuff at the start of the derivation instead of at the end of it, which is the traditional way we do the derivation. And I got to the same point where I had to say what was going on at the well bore, and I wound up with this expression. I was blown away because all of a sudden I was confronted by the fact i had done this derivation dozens of times, and I did not have to say the rate or the pressure is fixed. All I had was this expression. That was it, literally. The, the magic number there was one third. And what happened? I was stumped because I would have expected to have to specify the rate is whatever, or the pressure is, and it didn't. You don't see it there. It's embedded in the definition of dimensionless pressure, but it's not explicit like the other approach view. That really set me back on my heels. I mean, it really did. I was just what have I done? Then I dawned on me. Imagine you have a garden hose, okay? And you blow up the garden hose. Now, I don't know why you do this, but imagine you're going to do it. <laughs> okay, you don't want to do it. You don't have to do it. I'll do it. I really blow on the hose hard. I mean, really get with it. A lot of delta P, right? Well, you can hear it. And a fairly high volume, a lot of hot air. <laughs> and then very gently blow on the hose. Very low pressure drop at a very low rate. Yeah? The two are sympathetic. A high delta P and a high Q, a low delta P and a low Q. Exactly what Darcy's Law says should happen. <coughs> this says that as long as the delta P and the Q are proportional to each other, ah, they are sympathetic. Now, let's think a second. Let's go back a step. Can you imagine a scenario in which the rate and the pressure drop are not sympathetic? Yeah. When the pressure drop across here exceeds a ratio of about 2.1 thermal, Remember the thermal calculation for sonic velocity across a plate. That's what it is. When the pressure drop gets high enough, or the pressure change gets great enough, to say it in different words, the two are no longer sympathetic. 
the right through the orifice or the hose or whatever you want to think about is no longer proportional to the delta P. Oh, there is a specific condition in which this is violated, but up until that condition, this statement applies. Wow, that really is a game changer. Because that says, and that constant out there is only a function of the flow geometry of the system. So, as long as the rate and pressure change are sympathetic to one another, delta P goes up, rate goes up, or vice versa, that statement works, and it says that as I move out in the reservoir, as long as that statement applies, I can do the math. And if you start there with that understanding of it, you go on through derivation and you get exactly the same derivation that is published in the literature. Okay? So the effect of it is that as long as that sympathy condition is satisfied, the math works. Yeah? What's the that's psi. Does that represent pressure? Well, uh, in this setting, it is what is referred to as the dimensionless pressure. We'll go there in a second. But basically, that sick joke, I guess. I chose to name my company Performance Sciences Inc., the acronym of which is PSI, and that's the Greek letter psi. <laughs> is essentially the pressure, but it's a whole bunch, it's, it's quite a bit more than that. But we'll, we'll dig into that here in just a second. Good point. Thank you. All right? So, the point is this. Classic well testing takes into consideration the two extremes, the constant pressure or the constant rate extreme. And what I, my thesis to you is that, and there's some good theory that supports why the thesis is robust, all of the stuff in between all of the scenarios of various rates and various pressures from fixed rate to fixed pressure are legitimate as long as the rate and delta P are sympathetic to one another, all right? So it is no longer necessary to have, it is sufficient, but not necessary to have a fixed rate or a fixed pressure. The examples I showed you this morning were fixed rates, okay? That's one of the extreme sufficient conditions. But in the math, that's not, that is sufficient, but not a necessary condition. All right, so with that idea in mind, let's dig into what that side thing is. At this point, you've had a PBT class, and I hope in the PBT class, you visited the question about pseudo-pressure. Al Husseini and Ramey introduced the concept of pseudo-pressure back in the 60s. Pseudo-pressure was intended for the purpose of correcting for non-ideal properties of natural gas. And it works, I have no question, it works. But it's only applicable to natural gas. Well, there's this one idiot with a blue shirt in the front of the room that said, hey, that's cool, but he thinks that these reservoir systems are anything but single phase. And so he would like to find a way to model multi-phase systems. Well, so he came up with a thing he refers to as pseudo-potential because, uh, because of the thermodynamics issue. Let's think about it a minute. Suppose I took a really big box and I had one of the graduate students go in the box and count all the molecules. That's what graduate students are good for. If you don't believe me, ask them. You, Frank, go. And you'll get a master's thesis when you're finished, 48 years from now. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Damn, move. Oh, well, we've got to start over here. Yeah, that old man. That old man. He knows the temperature, he knows the pressure, and he knows how many molecules of stuff are in the box, right? And all of it is in gaseous phase. There's no liquids, no solids in there except himself. Fred, come out of the box. Come on, Fred. Out. Fred. Oh, thank you. Now, we get two other graduate students to push on the corners of the box, right? A little smaller, the pressure went up, the temperature probably went up a bit, but now it's cooled back off. So no molecules escaped, so we know how many molecules are in there, right? We know the size of the box, we put the box on a, on a scale and we can weigh the box, 
So we know the density of the fluid, don't we? Because it's weight divided by volume. And if we get a little funky about it, we can put a measure on here because our box is flexible. And we can do this to the box. Right? We can shear the box. Well, that's what viscosity is all about. The amount of force it takes over the distance, the amount of shear, the amount of energy necessary to shear a fluid by a certain amount. That's viscosity. So that takes three other graduate students. So I now have the viscosity of the system, and I have its density. And I don't care what's in the box, except that I know there were 873 trillion cubic, never mind, you get the point. OK, grad students. It's getting heavy here. Weigh it, I know the density. Wiggle it, I know the viscosity. But I look in the box, hey, look there. There's a droplet of liquid in there. This thing just went through the triple point, and I now have a multi-phase system. Oh, but I can still talk in terms of a density and a viscosity that is meaningful. OK, grad students, do your thing. Oh, now it's all liquid, except there's a bubble right up there in the corner. Same drill. And I didn't have to get into any discussion about the phase behavior, or I'm sorry, the multiphase character of the system. And finally, if I really get crazy, I can push on it so hard that I put it all into solid state, actually. Right? Wow. I didn't do anything wrong. That's just the experiment I performed. And since I said that the temperature was constant, it doesn't have to be. But for this discussion, I have conceded that I can take this box, which started as single phase gas, and squished it down to the point that it's single phase solid and done nothing physically wrong except I weighed it, measured the volume, and I shook it. And I have all the values in there regardless of the, whether it's liquid, gas, or solid. All right? So I have defined a path. Well, stop thinking about that a minute. What I did when I started squishing the box, I had to exert energy against it. Right? So that is the path that measures how I exerted energy into the box. Wow. That's why that's a Gibbs free energy relationship. Think about it this way. Suppose I had a very low density fluid, very compressible, that had a high viscosity. I don't know of one, but that's all right. We're just playing mental games right now. Highly compressible, but very viscous. When I shake it, it's going to use up a lot of energy, but when I expand it, it's going to release a lot of energy. It has a lot of free energy in that system. Okay? Conversely, work it the other way. I've got a system which is very incompressible, very high density, but low viscosity. The same scenario plays itself the other way. Because it is incompressible, highly, very low compressibility, it doesn't have a whole lot of energy to release as it changes volume. But it takes a lot of it takes a very little energy to shift it. So I'm just on the other side of the coin. Right? So that's actually a measure of the energy in the system and how the system consumes that energy. Alright? Does that make some sense? That's why they built the idea of pseudopotential. I just decided to get crazy and carry it another step and try to get away from the restraint of being only for gases. And that's basically it. So the density is pounds of stuff that occupy a fixed volume. The viscosity is what's referred to as the von Karman viscosity. The von Karman viscosity is the volume weighted viscosity. All right, so basically it says, okay, I've got this much stuff in there, has this much viscosity. If you go read Manami and Brill, one of the very classic multi-phase flow papers, they introduce the idea of the von Karman viscosity. So that's what that's about. So this is a means to correct the reservoir pressure, be it initial pressure or the flowing pressure, for the fluid properties of the system. And I've not put a constraint on it about single phase. All right? So that's my first step away. Uh-oh. Now we get into some screws. This is the classic definition. If I just put a pressure here, piece of B, and I put pressures in here, 
I would be looking at the classic definition for dimensionless pressure. But I said to myself, so, I've done all this other work to try to handle non-constant non properties, so I'm going to put in psi here, the pseudo-potential, the amount of energy in the system initially, minus the amount of energy in the system at this point, at the well bore, at this time. Right? So, here's a cubic foot of stuff out here far from the well bore, and it's got a certain amount of energy in it. I'm going to measure that energy by measuring the pressure. And then I'm going to run over to the well bore. At this point in time, here's some stuff here at a different pressure that has, at this point in time, a different amount of energy in the system. Right? So, this numerator is a measure of the consumption of energy in the system. You see, now it's pressure. Yes? Because that's what I will use as my sensible metric. But in fact, that sensible metric is a predictor of energy <coughs> in the system. Okay? You see, geez, when I was a freshman here, I had no expectation I was going to go in this neighborhood. No, I know. That's my job. My job is to kick you out of your box. If I can achieve nothing else, by the end of the day tomorrow, if I have convinced you that spending time in a box ain't no fun, that will be a home run. Now, I will, agree, I will increase your uh, fear, I suppose, but I have to. <coughs> Pressure is a measure of the amount of energy. The difference is the amount of energy consumed doing what? Doing what? 